Hey everyone, how are we doing today? As always, thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. And as always, I hope you all were able to get outside and get a little bit of that sunshine in. With me today is someone who I have been following along on Instagram through her adventurous life. (laughs) She's a hunter, fitness advocate, and what I can see, she seems pretty authentic. So um, looking forward to having you on today, Jessica, and just chatting about what it's like to be a woman hunter and being true to our roots and um, the whole fitness aspect to all of that. And it's just great to have you on. So why don't you go ahead, Jessica, and tell us a little bit about who you are. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me on. I haven't been on a podcast in quite a while due to life. Right. <laughs> uh, it's been been a little bit of a wild ride coming out of 2020 and into 2021. So I'm excited to be on another one and, and it be with a, a girl. It's not often that I get to be on a podcast with another woman. So thank you for thinking of me. Absolutely. And for the kind words. Um, gosh, where do I start? Um, my, you know, at a young age, my dad got me into the outdoors I'm I'm originally from Central Texas, and I guess probably in middle school, uh, end of middle school, I decided I was ready to get behind the weapon and um, fell in love with hunting. Fell in love with the the confidence. I think that's really like one of the biggest things that hunting provides me is just the, the confidence to to grow in different skill sets and um, mental strength and. Uh, determination and you know uh, there's just so many areas that it uh, has a positive impact in your life so from there um, I fast forward a little bit I met my husband who was an avid bow hunter he started bow hunting when he was like eight years old because in Texas there's no age limit you can pretty much shoot whenever you want Um, and so I was very fortunate to have a mentor that like literally took me under his wing and within six months of dating he got me my first bow and literally like taught me the ropes from the very beginning and uh I give a lot of my credit you know for my success to him just because I there's not a lot of people who have like a a built-in mentor in your life and Mm -hmm. he's he's taught me a lot um and then you know after a few seasons of bow hunting I kept coming across other women who like they just couldn't wrap their minds around bow hunting and like being successful at it. And like, you know, I kept hearing the same thing. I just don't know how you can do that. Like it seems so hard. I could never do that. And that was my little calling to start a platform that catered to women and, you know, how we think and how we learn and how, you know, how we absorb information, I think is very different for men. That's what, you know, that's why we're individually, we're different, we're different people. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, I didn't see a lot of uh, platforms that provided that. And so, yeah, it just kind of took off from there. I branded it um, kind of catering to women. Um, my brand was is called Follow Her Arrow. And I just started writing about adventures and, you know, documenting everything. And it's connected me with some really awesome people. And it's a very, very strong a uh, small industry and strong industry. Mm-hmm, uh, both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of passionate individuals and you meet some really cool people. Um, and it's brought me to Utah, Southern Utah. I ended up meeting this CEO of Hunt and Pool and decided to, you know, move up here full time from Texas. I'd never like permanently moved outside of the state. I've traveled all around the world to hunt, but like, Never thought I would pick up my roots <laughs> right. and get away from that. Mm-hmm. But, um, no, it's beautiful here. I love Utah. And now I live at, or I'm, I'm what I consider living the dream. I'm um, working for a 25-year company that's like a hub for Western hunting. Mm-hmm. And for a Southern girl that, you know, fell in love with elk hunting, it just, I'm just like, uh, it's like sensory overload. You right. know, I work with some really intelligent <laughs> people. I'm always learning. I'm just getting further and further into it and continue to meet cool people like you. Right. (laughs) So the connections that I have made just from being on the podcast, I started doing interviews around the new year and it just blows my mind. The, the connections you make with these people and the conversation that you're able to have just from like you and I have never spoken to all of a sudden just being like, Hey, let's chat about these things that we are passionate about. It's pretty cool. 
Yeah, and I think you learn um, a side of people that you can't, you just can't possibly get through a screen. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, with all the trade shows being canceled, it eliminated a lot of those avenues to connect with people Mm -hmm. and and build relationships. So it's really neat that, you know, podcasts have opened up, you know, a a different, a different um, way of connecting. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I went to this guy's house last week. Now he's my great friend, <laughs> um, but brought the recording equipment and we did a, an episode there in his house. And it was so great to just sit down in somebody's house and have conversation and not have a mask being over your face. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he had all these trophies in his house. So we talked about that and he's got an archery shop, but it was just really nice to have conversation face to face versus you know, majority of this is all over the phone just because yeah. we want to reach a more broader audience. We want to talk to people in different states as well. So For sure. uh, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about your uh, whole journey with 75 Hard. I was super inspired by that. I recently have kind of had a moment of reflection where I realize I have become like complacent and comfortable and yeah. when I'm complacent and comfortable, my creative like juices, my, I don't feel like I'm at my full potential. And so I kind of had that realization this winter and was like, I need to start moving my body every single day. I need to not have two beers when I get home from work. And <laughs> yeah. I need to like be writing and I need to be sleeping. I haven't had an alarm. I haven't set an alarm since I moved to Steamboat this past fall. Um, wow. Luckily, my job allows me to go in kind of whatever time I feel like I need. Usually it's around 10 o'clock. And so it allows me to just like naturally wake up with the sun. Usually it's around like 730 to 740 is um, my body just naturally wakes up and I feel super well rested. It's not like this anxiety of having to set an alarm. And right. so when I saw you like getting up at like five in the morning to work out and to like journal or read or tell us just a little bit more about that whole journey like why you decided to do 75 hard and kind of the things that it really taught you throughout the whole process yeah for sure um well for starters I can completely relate to the complacency I think like most humans can um and I think it says a lot about you as a person to even recognize that you're in that state of mind because most people you know, they may like, you're like, Oh, life is great. You know, they're not being challenged. They're not being pushed and, and they're okay with it. And I would say that's the majority of the world that we live in. Um, I'm not here to bash that by any means, but I just think there's something to be said for, um, an individual who wants to push that and grow. And, um, so you're already on the right track to be like, Oh wow, I'm, I'm getting comfortable. And, Mm -hmm. That's not good <laughs> for you. You know, if you, yeah. I don't know your personality completely, but for me, it doesn't work. I get, I get bored. Um, I start to have like negative self-talk. Mm-hmm. Um, I really struggle with, with that whenever I don't feel like I'm a, a working towards something more. So that's usually like my red flag when I like, yeah. s- I'm starting to like, I look in the mirror and I'm like, Ugh. and I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do some push-ups, yeah, go run, like do something, move your body, get that yeah, oxygen flow into you your move, brain. Mm-hmm. You, when you start moving, it's like that. It's like when you go do that first workout and then all of a sudden you're like, I look strong. I look good. And you're like, you, you literally only worked out for an hour and <laughs> you felt horrible before, but it just goes to show like how empowering it is. It's so, so empowering. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I started it well without getting into too much detail, I'll say like I went through a really, really, really dark place. Um, October of 2020, I was just like, it was rock bottom. Um, I was, I was just struggling. Um, I don't, I'm not in a position to really talk about why, but I can just tell you it wasn't, it was ugly. It was not a good place. It's not, it's not a place I'd wish anybody to be in, but I think everybody has had or will have, a a taste of that right like we all have baggage we all have obstacles we all have Mm -hmm. things in life that we can't control that just kind of get thrown our way and it's just how you react to that and um after a brief period of victim behavior you know feeling sorry for myself I was like no I can't I'm not gonna react like this like 
and I kept seeing things. I had lightly heard about 75 hard throughout 2020. Um, I knew of several people who said they were going to do it, tried to do it. Um, and you know, it's hard. It's not, it's, it's a struggle. And I hadn't met anybody that had completed it. And, um, I was in, I went home for in Texas. I was at home sitting in my parents' kitchen and my stepmom was talking about, you know, in her life, I was like, I need a reset. I've seriously been thinking about doing 75 hard. And I'm like, no, dude, I could never do that. Like that was literally my first thought. And then I was like, you know what? I don't even know what the program complete, like what it truly entails. And so I went and listened to the podcast and Andy Priscilla was like, if you're sitting there saying that you don't think you can complete it, you're the, that's the exact reason why you need to start it. And I was like, Damn. <laughs> so, like, Inspired. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you, brother. <laughs> and so um, I started it the next day. Like, I flew home that, that day, and I, I started it immediately within mm-hmm. 24 hours. And it's one of those things where if you think about it too long, you overthink it, and you won't start it until, yeah. unfortunately, until you probably hit a, a rough spot, and you know it's like you're being forced into change. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, the the program as a whole for anybody listening who's not familiar with it, it's still pretty fresh. I think it came out like a couple of years ago, maybe or maybe even just a year ago. I'm not completely sure on that. I want to say 2019, but it might be 2020. Anyway, um, it requires you to work out twice a day for 45 minutes, and one of those workouts has to be outside. So, and he's and and I'll preface this whole outline by saying like. There is no wiggle room. Like it's not a what well, uh, forty three minutes or I did I worked out really hard for thirty minutes or like it's forty five minutes start to finish every single day. One has to be outdoors. Now your outdoor workout can be a it can be a walk. It doesn't have to be it can be a hike, a walk. It doesn't have to be like insanely intense. Um, they just want you to move your body and they want this program to be something that anybody can can achieve right so mm-hmm. if you're 300 pounds overweight you can get outside and walk for 45 minutes so that's the idea of this entire challenge is more mentally challenging than physical and i in my mind maybe not to outsiders looking in but in my mind i i was mentally weak at especially last quarter of 2020 so that was my motivation and um so two 45 minute workouts you drink a gallon of water a day you take a progress picture every single day. Um, you read at least 10 pages a day. And you ha- no alcohol, no cheat meals. You have to follow a diet of some kind. I hate the word diet. Like Andy right. even talks about like if you just eat clean, if you know what clean eating is, that's sufficient. But there's some people who don't know. They don't have that. Like um, they're not structured enough to know. Like they'll try to bend it a little bit. So. Right. I think that's what kind of why he pushes like follow paleo, follow keto, follow vegetarian, like follow a you know carnivore, whatever that looks like. Um, but I would say I floated between like a, a paleo and keto. Um, I quickly found out that dairy was not my friend, so I switched mm-hmm. to like a pretty like paleo, somewhat whole thirty, but clean eating. You know, mm-hmm. eat whole foods, eat balanced meals. Um, fuel your body as if it's a machine. Um, so yeah, that was the overall program for 75 days straight. And if you miss anything, and I mean, like if you only read nine pages and oh, and by the way, the book, the books have to be hard, hardcover nonfiction books. Hmm. So, um, no audio books. Um, and, and, that honestly was probably my, the, like one of the hardest things going into it. Cause I'm not really, I wasn't much of a reader. Now I love reading, but yeah. what um, did you read? I, so I read, I read five different books. Let me see if I can remember all of them. Cause I'm on like, I still kept reading some of like seven, I think now, but, um, so I read his needs, her needs, which is an incredible book on marriage. Um, or if you're thinking about getting married, yeah, if you have been married, you're divorced now, like, you know, I, I think it's just a very well-rounded book on marriage and how, you know, man, men and women think differently and what their priorities are. Um, I read a book called Beyond Betrayal, um, that just talks, just people letting you down, you know, friendships, work, marriage, like what, you know, whatever that looks like. 
um, I read It Starts With Food. And that was kind of like a Whole30 based book that taught me a lot about what you what we put in our body. I was a little bit worried about food going into it. But after the first three weeks, I felt like food's so easy to understand for me now. But in the beginning, I needed I needed understanding. I needed more knowledge. Um, and I really loved that book, like just a foundation of learning what food does for our body. Um Oh, gosh, what else did I read? I read, oh, Sovereignty by Ryan Mickler. I, you know, it's for men. It's really, like, geared for men. His whole entire mission is for men. But you can take away a lot from it. He's he's a, an, a I guess he's a friend. I think more of a, an acquaintance in the industry. But um, I have heard a lot of the good things about his book from men. And I just wanted to support a friend, so I ordered it. And I loved that book. And then another one, I think my fifth one, which is actually my first one, is called It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And I started with that one just because it was in like a, a terrible place. Um, so, yeah, all those were good. And then right now I've been reading How to Be a Boss. <laughs> and then uh, Strong Women, Soft Hearts. And then my husband and I are both reading Wild at Heart which nice. is so freaking good. Um, yeah. So I like, now like, you love to read. read. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you think about it, 10 pages, yeah. like what's 10 pages, right? Yeah. Anybody can read 10 pages. Now, yeah. some nights I had to read it. I had to like open physically open my eyes. I was so exhausted. Exactly. But, um, but so. yeah, I think you read about things that, um, that are curious, like something that you're curious about. And then also finding books that are in different <clears> categories. So, marriage food business um you know motivational like whatever whatever that mm -hmm. looks like i think switching it up kind of helped me too I th yeah exactly um did you find what was your hardest mental challenge with all of it was it was it time management was it getting the actual workout in was it the reading portion what did you find the biggest challenge mm. was you know, there were nights where I was out doing my outside walk at, you know, 11 o'clock mm -hmm. or midnight in the rain and hail and, you know, snow. Yeah. Um, but it's weird because I think what is initially challenging for you evolves. And, you know, like anything, when you do it enough, what, what was once hard becomes the norm, mm -hmm. right? And that's the whole point of this program. Like, that's why I'm still doing some of these things because it's just normal now mm -hmm. it's not hard right um so I think initially like squeezing in that outdoor workout so then I had to I started walking on my lunch break so that when I got home from work I was home I could mm -hmm. relax I could curl up and read a book I could meal prep I, I felt like I had time right um also saving my reading till the like till late at night at times was really rough because I was exhausted or I'd like I started combining like you learn how to you learn how to squish time together to knock out multiple things. So like, obviously I was sore as hell. I was doing intense weight training in the morning and then, so my muscles would be tight. So I would take Epsom salt baths and then read my book in the bath. Mm -hmm. So I was like really taking care of myself mentally and, and literally and physically at the same time while accomplishing the program. But, um, the easiest thing to forget is the progress picture. <laughs> I mean, honestly, yeah. like if, if you don't wake up and take that picture immediately or like right after your workout when, you know, you just got home from the gym and you're looking at yourself anyway, you might as well just take a picture. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, ooh, did I gain an ab in that one? Ooh, looking yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So that would be yeah. my, you know, some of my, I have a lot of little tips that I learned along the way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the challenges changed. Food, food was my, food and reading were my biggest fears going into it mm -hmm. um, because I've always been, pretty I'm built like just from genetics I'm built thin and I can hide weight or like lack of muscle pretty freaking well mm -hmm. and so um I can I my metabolism my metabolism has always been pretty insane just ate whatever I wanted whenever I want but I didn't feel good right yeah. like I have extreme inflammation through my body mm -hmm. I was you know having like sugar crashes I would get dizzy without you know like and I'm, I've always known that it wasn't normal, but I didn't have the motivation to fix it. And so 
the whole entire program has been a, just the biggest blessing. And then I went from not knowing anybody that completed it to just opening up this entire community through social that is just like, just lifted me up, you know, mm -hmm. and I, it's been really, really, really cool. Um, I can't say enough good things about the program. It sounds like it's all, everything's positive coming from it. And it really makes us stop for a minute and think about our own health. And it's like, am I like living at my full potential? Like I right. feel good now, but like if I did more or if I did less of this, would I feel much right. better, you know? And I feel like we, we all are on our own little fitness journey. Everyone's different. Some people love to lift a lot, a lot of weights to really get that mental clarity and like that confidence that they need. Some people run 20 miles a day, you know, we all, yeah, we all have That's our, what's so cool. Mm -hmm. You can cater it to whatever it is that, you know, that fits you best. Mm -hmm. Um, my friend Rihanna is doing it right now and she's on like day 13 or 14 and she, she's been running for both of her workouts and that girl can run forever. She, mm -hmm. <laughs> she just goes and runs up, runs for 45 minutes. You, you're you not going to catch me doing that unless I like sign up for a run, like a, you know, a, a race probably, mm -hmm. um, like a 5k and I'm, I'm good. I don't really run more than that, but also because I really struggle to gain muscle. So, that's what's so cool. He doesn't, he doesn't structure it so strict that you're like, you feel trapped, mm -hmm. you know, really the only trap that you're in is your own mind thinking that you can't do it exactly. because you, every single human is capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, it kind of takes away that intimidating factor. I feel like, yeah, you know, um, yeah, for sure. I hear people say, I'm not runner or I'm not a, like, I can't lift weights or I can't do that. You know, because they've tried a few times and it made them uncomfortable. And so they figured they weren't capable of doing it. But we all are capable. I think it's just the conversation starts in our head and what we're telling ourselves. I'm sure that was a huge transformation for you as well was just the conversations changing in your mind to a much more positive, supportive route. A hundred percent. Yeah. There, and, you know, there were days where... In, in the beginning where I wasn't crazy about jumping out of bed to go to the gym, you know, to be up at five, five fifteen, and, you know, go hit the weights really hard. Um, but you never regret a workout. Like I, I've never heard of someone regretting mm -hmm. putting time into their health. Um, it's just like, it's just a proven avenue for relieving stress for clarity um, for strength, like it, it just, it accomplishes so many things. And to start your day like that, um, it, it just, it truly changed my life it, to the point where like, I would say even before halfway, I was so excited to get up and go to the gym. And now it's just, it's like brushing my teeth. Yeah. Um, it's a natural way I of can't, life. Yeah. And I missed it. Like even being in the mountains this weekend, I was hiking like so many miles a day, but I was so excited to like, I was looking forward to coming home and going to my classes, you know, mm -hmm. and lifting heavy weights. And like, you see your, you see yourself start to accomplish things that you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's really cool. And I think too, with it being 75 days, like a lot of programs are, you know, 21 days creates a habit, 30 days, this 60 days, this like 75, I, like it's hard mm -hmm. <laughs> it is and it's a good and while you yeah and you learn the benefits of being consistent in multiple areas of your life that's what's so empowering is like it seems silly to take a picture every day it seems silly to read 10 pages a day like you know for some people you know but once you do it like in other words I'm not going to pick up a book in the first 10 pages it's not going to change my life. But when you get through 75 days and you've read five, six, seven books, depending on how much you read, mm -hmm. you're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that time frame is, he nailed it, really. Yeah. Sounds like a cool program. And it sounds um, like not like a fad. Like I feel like a lot of these programs that come through, you know, it's, oh, for sure. it's giving people almost unrealistic expectations. But I feel right. like with a lot of this, it's it's up to you to complete it. It's up to you to put in the time. So 
I think that's yeah. very important. And it, it brought a thought to my mind. I was following along as you were on your shed hunt and it looked like you put in quite a few miles each day. Yeah. And just being able to have that physical strength to be able to put in those miles and to still feel, I saw one of your stories and it was like, did however many miles, but like still feeling strong and feeling good and yeah. how important that is, especially for hunters, um, to, to make sure we are performing well and we're taking care of ourselves. So when we're out there, you know, the more that you put in the time for yourself and with your body and training and, you know, all the shooting, the higher chances are that you are going to be successful out there. And I've, I've come to realize that like when I'm feeling strong and good, like, all right, we need to go to that ridge. Let's go. And there's yeah. no like, Oh, I need to eat a snack. Like, yeah, I remember, you know, years past when I first moved up to Colorado, I was just, I was like banking on that sugar, just constantly snacking, constantly like eating these carbs, be like, I need energy. You know, I need to yeah. fuel myself versus like actually being physically ready and trained to be able to run up and down mountains chasing those the elk or the deer or bear whatever it is you're going after but no that's so yeah. true I told my husband that um actually coming off that shed hunt because he's like are you sore and I was like there's a like a tiny bit of tightness behind my knee that tendon on the outside of your knee on mm -hmm. the back side like just get sore from trying to stabilize on different rocks like that are sliding, you know, mm -hmm. and you're climbing it and not and like side hilling. Like those aren't muscles that you work in the gym necessarily. Um, you're not going to get it on a Stairmaster. Like you need to get on the mountain and do it. And I was yeah. like, that's a little bit like tight, but I could literally go out and do it all over again mm -hmm. and be fine. And that's crazy because I would normally be hurting so bad and I, I truly think it's from like not knowing how to feel my body. And I'm still learning that. Like I'm a little nervous going into fall because the way I've been eating, I don't know how realistic it is to take that on the mountain. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get, you know, get some things dialed in earlier on. Um, but I do know like the sugars and the grains and the dairy, like that was causing extreme inflammation throughout my body. And I think in moderation, like it's totally fine, but, right. um, I was, yeah, the same way, just like constantly eating. And I was, when I was shed hunting this past weekend, I literally ate, I ate eggs and bacon in the morning. And then I make these overnight oats and these mason jars and I eat that every single day. So I had eggs and bacon. And then right before we went out, I just inhaled those oats. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat again until we got back like to camp. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think about food, which yeah. is unreal. And I, I think it's because... Well, I don't know. I'm not a nutritionist, but I, I think it's from, I think my body's in like, it's running off of fat instead of carbs and sugar, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, because normally I would never last. I would get dizzy. I'd feel sick. I would like, couldn't keep going. So it's very interesting, like what our bodies are capable of when you just work with it, you know, Pay like attention you give to it. it a chance. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I'm freaking stoked for this season because I felt good last season. I had the best season of my life in 2020. Like, not, I didn't. I don't think it can be topped, but I, that doesn't mean I can't feel better in the process. You right. know, like I think it's going to be really fun to just run ridges and <laughs> and feel strong. What so. are What are some of your hunts? Um, I so I go elk hunting with my dad each year, um, and we usually go to New Mexico. So I'll probably be hunting in New Mexico again in September. I did put in for my archery mule deer hunt here in Utah. And I should draw it because I'm a resident now. So I I like I think I have a 90% chance or something. Mm -hmm. um, I should draw that. So that'll be my focus in August. And then I'm sure I'll go back to Texas during around Thanksgiving. Um, just you know, it's, I would like to go end of October, 1st of November, like when they're, you know, starting to move a little bit and they're just like, it's about to get good. Mm -hmm. Um, but my, just getting to see my family on a holiday, I, I just, I'll probably end up there on, around Thanksgiving again. And then, man, I, that's all I have right now. I am trying to squeeze in an antelope hunt or maybe, um, another white tail hunt somewhere. Gotcha. But Outside of that, I don't know. And obviously, like, we're right in the middle of application season right now. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of results that haven't come out yet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm waiting on draw results. And then from there, I'll start looking at, like, maybe over-the-counter Arizona, you know, deer or something like that where I can 
just something that's guaranteed that I can go and do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll wait until the draws come out just to gotcha. plan around that. Yeah. T- tell everyone a little bit more about Hunt and Fool. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are pretty familiar with it, but if some aren't, if you can just kind of give us a little idea of um, what Hunt and Fool is and the services they offer. Yeah. So I was trying to make this like super quick, but there's really not a 60 second elevator pitch for (laughs) our company um, because it's a 25 year company. So there's a lot of history there. Mm -hmm. Um, First and foremost, there are, um, there's a lot of places that you can find um, draw odds and even application services. Um, There's other, you know, publications. These are all things that we do. I think the thing that separates us the most are, the hunt advisors so we have i think we're up to nine hunt advisors right now we have a few that work remote so um we have a handful here in the office and then several that are remote where you can call into if you're a member you can call into the office and tell our inbound team what you're looking for you know what species you're interested in what state you can be someone who has 20 points in Arizona and you want to burn them, or you can be someone who's never hunted in your life and call, but you have a person that will walk you through a consultation on getting started for Western hunting or, um, you know, building points, like understanding the draw systems. We cover 21 States. So there's just, just a lot of knowledge and content pumping through this office um, that would blow your mind. I mean, they're they're paid for boots on the ground experience. So, excuse me, boots on the ground experience. So, um, in other words, they're paid to be in the field hunting. They get a lot of uh, a lot of days in the field. They're required to hunt two new units every single season at, at minimum. You can hunt more than that, but um, in other words, you just can't keep going back to the same unit over and over again. Mm-hmm. And um, that creates more knowledge, um, around the, you know, the terrain, what is it like physically, the pressure, the, you know, opportunity, what does that look like? And, um, and sorry, somebody just knocked on my door uh, <laughs> and they bring that knowledge back to be able to help our members and be like, yeah, I've, I've been on that you know, in that unit, this is what I learned about it. And then also, obviously these guys can't cover every unit across the West, but what's cool is we also have um, an endorsed outfitter department where we work with, you know, roughly 500 outfitters across um, the States that we put our stamp of approval on, like they're legit. They have incredible references, um, lots of great experiences across our members. And those outfitters help us, learn about the units too you know they can Mm kind of give us a report of what it was like what was the pressure like what was the um you know what did you like was there a lot of you know a lot of population did you see a lot of predators like they just get a big picture about that area um as well as with biologists so they keep in touch with biologists and um just really work closely with people scattered across the west to figure out like what do we need to know about this area so we can help our members plan accordingly? Um, and it's, it's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, I think our kind of like our flagship is, is our publication. And I know that that print isn't, you know, print magazines aren't what they used to be, but I still think, and maybe I'm biased, but I, I mean, I truly think we have one of the nicest publications in the industry, if not the nicest, it's like coffee table where they, they're beautiful and they're jam packed with this information that, the guys create themselves like they're Mm -hmm. actually writing comments on the units and boots on the ground right yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um of course we have you know we touch on products and and you know work with our advertisers and stuff but it's really like it's data rich Mm -hmm. um and it's it's a way of taking these really crappy state websites that are all different that have no no correlation whatsoever no consistency and they put it in this beautiful format in a, in a publication. And of course there's a digital version too, if you like mm-hmm. to look at on, on the computer, but um, yeah, it's like, it's presented in a way that you can actually digest it um, as far as, you know, uh, the six, the success from year to year, mm-hmm. um, the draw odds, um, how many tags are, are, you know, given to that, that area year after year. So 
It's cool yeah, to see it. Have- there's factored in like how many landowner tags, how many youth tags, out of staters, residents. Um, I feel like it really breaks it down so you get a, a general idea of what your chances are, whether you're a non res or a resident or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, so a, a being a member will give you access to all of that. However, we do have a separate a separate department, which is our license application department. And that's a huge part of our business. Um, where if you, you know, you're talking to the hunt advisors, you're reading all this data, you kind of have a game plan, but maybe you're really busy or you suck at <laughs> deadlines and you miss mm-hmm. deadlines or you, you aren't really, you just don't want to have that responsibility. You can hand it over to our license application department and you become a license application client. And mm. we apply for you. We handle all your states, your usernames, your passwords, your receipts. We'll call you if you draw. Like they wow. literally take all the responsibility. Yeah. And and they've been I mean, they're incredible. They've been doing it a long time. And then furthermore, this year we launched a um a completely digital platform for that. So um in the past and even across all of our competitors, everything was done by hand and paperwork, right? We, we mailed a paper, we mailed a packet to them, told us, told the client to check what state and species they're interested in. You know, are you in it for the, you know, the trophy unit? Are you just wanting, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? And then we, we take that paperwork and apply them. Now we have a system that's completely digital, which nobody else has that. Um, Mm -hmm. It was a huge launch this year. We even have a draw cost calculator where you can go in. Like, you don't have to be a member to do this. Anybody, general public, can go on our website, access a draw cost calculator where you punch in state, species, what you want to apply for, and we'll send you a quote for free, completely free. You'll get a PDF email to you that tells you, okay, with this with this plan, you these are your out of, these are your out of pocket costs. This is what you're, you know, what you're not going to get back this is all the fees that you're going to, this is what you're going to spend if you draw everything, which nobody draws everything, but Mm -hmm. we show you that cost. And then we show you another cost associated with, this is what it would cost for us to do all of it for you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a quote instantly, like immediately to your inbox. And that's, there's, you have to put your email in. That's it to get Mm -hmm. the quote. Um, So, yeah, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I would, the way I describe hunting full and like kind of our tagline is that we help people go on more hunts with better information. At yeah. the end of the day, we, we want you to draw more tags. We want you to have a short term and long term strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, we're here to to help members accomplish that, and um, we're just a hub for Western hunting data mm-hmm. and planning. It's a great resource, yeah. absolutely. And if you're in, in a an elite onyx member you do get a free subscription to hunt and fool correct yes you get a free you get a free digital yeah. subscription um you do get a price break for upgrading to you know have access to the hunt advisors or have a print copy of the magazine or the all access that gives you ac- that gives you you know the print and the hunt advisors mm-hmm. you can you do get a price break for that upgrade, but yes, if you're an Onyx Elite member, sh- member, you will get completely free digital version of our membership, and that will give you access to our magazine. It just won't be a hard copy. Gotcha. Yeah, and then- it'll give you the draw odds and um, previous tag holder list. If you draw a great tag and you like, oh man, I want to start researching this, you can call and request a um, request a list of people who have drawn that exact tag. And the way that it works is once you request that list and, and they'll give you, depending on the unit, if it's really hard to draw, you might only have like a, you know, a few resources, uh, the ones that are easier to draw, they usually give around, I don't know, I think around a dozen contacts or so. Mm-hmm. But the way that it works is that once you request that you are volunteering yourself to become a part of that list. And so that, that database is like up to like, I think 26,000 people right now. Oh, wow that have that are on like that are have volunteered to be on that list to you know for the other people to reach out to yeah that's really cool yeah. such a great resource i love all the resources that are coming about and you know despite the crazy times that we've been in for the last year um we will figure it out <laughs> yeah. you know and yeah. people i think are really starting to realize that 
um, community is super important and supporting um, other businesses, whether they're local or just businesses in general that um, support you and whether it's some of your hobbies or just your lifestyle in general. It's kind of a crazy, cool time to be alive right now. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. Think, I think the outdoor industry especially has seen – you know, a positive impact from all this, Mm -hmm. um, with, with COVID, it's like people are more desperate than ever to get outdoors. Like hunting licenses and numbers are, are, are up. Mm -hmm. They're higher than they've been in a long time. We've seen growth within our company. Um, when everything did hit last year, we thought, man, we're going to lose a lot of like, you know, even license application clients because they can go apply for themselves and, Mm -hmm. you know, cut some costs there. No, did we, I think we, we might we might have lost a couple maybe um it just shows like the passion of outdoorsmen and like Mm -hmm. you think about it when you're going through a rough time the last thing you want to give up is the one thing that sets you free from the rest of the chaos of the world right so exactly the outdoors has i think is a lot of people's um safe place and it it's positively impacted us and this industry and hopefully the future of of hunting you know i hope Mm -hmm. it does I think, I think so. I think we'll be all right. (laughs) Yeah. We could only hope for the best, right? But right, it's really cool. The family that I work for, their youngest boy, he's seven. And I took him out rabbit hunting uh, just at the end of the season. And, you know, he just brought his BB gun. He wasn't hunting, but he was just like tagging along and he was wearing his orange and practicing his gun safety. And he has That's not awesome. stopped talking about rabbit hunting ever since then. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Just keep, <laughs> like, you can instill this in him, you know, like he's showing, you know, now at seven years old, like he wants to hunt. We had elk for dinner the other night and I was like, hey, buddy, what's your favorite meat? And he's like, elk. He's like, I'm on my fourth piece of elk. He was just so proud that, you know, and he just loved it. And I was like, this is perfect. I hope, uh, this isn't just a phase and hopefully I could instill something into these kiddos that, um, they weren't previously exposed to and they get a grasp of it and realize that it's, it's kind of a cool thing. So, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's been really, it's been really like fun and interesting and like kind of, uh, not overwhelming, but just like, it blows my mind how many people, recently have within like the last year or so that have for once started hunting and have like reached out you know my friend sent me these photos and she's like here's some gear I'm gonna buy and it's like all stuff from Amazon and I'm like uh-huh. empty your cart go to your <laughs> local archery shop and yeah. test out <laughs> some of the gear like you don't need to be buying your archery stuff from off Amazon <laughs> there's yeah. a community here and resources that can help you with that you know and, for sure. um, but for somebody that's never been exposed to that, they don't know, you know? And so it's been really cool to, just to see all these people that have, and I'm sure the pandemic has been a big part to realize, like, if I need to survive, like I need to know how to do this. Like if I need to, if I go to the store and there's no meat and my family's hungry, I need to be able to provide for them. So it's been really cool oh, to see, for sure. to see that light click on in a lot of people's brains and um yeah it's really cool to be a part of that for sure and one one thing that you reminded me of when you're talking about the the kid rabbit hunting is you know there was a a brief time in my life um when I went off to college I was just you know in school full-time working full-time living it up you know I wasn't I wasn't close to it's Texas, right? So it's mm-hmm. like all private land. I wasn't close to anywhere. I had access to property. And, and I just, I, did, I wasn't hunting for a few years. Um, and I came back to it and, you know, I talked, I've talked to my dad about it a few times. And I was like, did, you know, the other day I asked him, did you ever think I'd be working in the hunting industry? And he's like, all you, all you have to do is plant the seed. And I found that very interesting because if someone's introduced to the outdoors and to hunting and this way of life in the right way with respect and it's, and they're focused on the right things, Mm -hmm. they might drift away from it for a little bit, but they, they will more than likely come back to it at some point in their life, Mm -hmm. whether it's, yeah, whether it's this pandemic, whether it's um, just wanting to be more in tune, like more in touch with their food or they're in a bad place. They need that freedom that like, you know, get, like get me out of this 
mm-hmm. you know, the busyness of life. Like he's like, you just have to plant that seed. And I, it's always stuck with me um, when he said that. And I think especially for kids, like they just, mm-hmm. they just adapt to it so well. Um, if we could, if we could only, uh, you know, introduce them to it more. Right. Um, we'd be doing ourselves a big favor. Yeah. He's, he's always like, do you think we can take the BB gun and go hunt squirrels or this and that? And I'm like, we have to wait till season. And they're (laughs) like, what's a season? (laughs) Yeah. You know, like their brains are little sponges. Like they have no idea that there's rules and regs to all of this, you know, but little by little. So I'm excited to hopefully, uh, take them on their first hunt. That's for a few more years still, but be really cool to, to see that happen. Yeah, for sure. And that's really yeah. cool. It's been cool to also see the relationship that you have with your dad. Cause I feel, well, most of us, I should say who are hunters, we've all learned from somebody typically when we were young, usually somebody yeah. introduced it to us when we were young and it's something that we've carried on into, into our life. And so I, I see a lot of the stuff that you post with you and your dad and it always touches home a little bit. Cause for me, that's where my whole connection with hunting really started. Yeah, I come from a big family and I hunted with a lot of my siblings, you know, I would go out with my brothers and they would teach me and my sister and I would go out. But it was always those times with my dad where it was just, you know, you understand the bond and I'm sure a lot of other people do. Um, but yeah. to be able to have that and, and the older I get, the more time I want to spend out there with him. I also know like his time is, he's not old, old, But, you know, we all know that our bodies naturally are prone to more accidents when we're older and you just never know when, uh, you know, when that last time is. So, um, it's cool to, yeah, we never take those for granted. So I really struggled with that last year when I was hunting with them, just, you know, I can see him aging because we've Mm -hmm. been gone on these yearly hunts for, well, we started hunting the West together in 2015. We've hunted you know, in the South in Texas for a long time, but, um, these annual Western hunts started, you know, someone just beeped in, sorry, I don't know if that picked up, but, um, yeah, I just started in 2015. I can just even see over the last, you know, six years, just him aging and it Mm -hmm. it does make me sad. And I do see him struggle, you know, last season, he shot multiple times. He just gets so cranked up. You know, he's killed tons of stuff with his bow and Mm -hmm. he just with elk. I've never seen somebody blink so bad. Um, he doesn't even know what he's doing. He just loses touch with reality Mm -hmm. completely. Just Mm -hmm. blanks, um, cannot slow his mind and go through the motions. And, um, I still am just praying that I can call a bull in for him and that be his first bull. It almost happened last year. He shot twice and missed. Mm-hmm. And I just was like, gosh, if that would probably be the, the biggest dream come true is to like say that I called my dad's first bull and that he finally connected on because he's missed a lot. <laughs> Bless his heart. Yeah. Um, Has he never shot one then? He hasn't shot a bull elk yet. No, he shot yeah. two moose, mo- white tail pigs, turkey. I mean, the guy can, he can shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, but the older he gets, he, he has the shakes real bad. I can't think of what it's called right now, but his hands shake quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's, he can still like hold steady enough. Like I said, he shot a moose a few years ago Mm -hmm. with me. Um, so he can do it. And and then he's, I've seen him shoot deer since then too. He just, with elk, he gets so pumped up. Um, and it is different. It's different to have something coming in and screaming in your face. So I'm not, I'm not blaming him. I've missed my fair share of animals too, but, um, you know, I just, all I can think about is I hope that he can get it done before he can't do it anymore. And even with like application strategy working here, obviously I learn about a lot more opportunities throughout the West that I Mm want to apply for. Even like in New Mexico, I want to apply for these top end units for the small chance that I'll draw them. But I don't because he's so attached to one unit. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do? I don't even have a second and third choice. I pick that first choice for him because when I lay my head down at night and I think what I regretted if I went and hunted something separate from him and didn't get to enjoy that tradition that we've created. Exactly. 
I would never forgive myself. Yeah. And so I'll just, I'm just going to keep doing that. You know, I just mm-hmm. keep putting him first until, until I can't anymore because I still got, you know, hopefully I have a lot of life left in me mm-hmm. and, you know, can take advantage of those other opportunities down the line. But yeah, it makes you think about all that. And especially, you know, moving away from Texas, you know, we first moved up here is his whole running joke was like, I'm still trying to figure out how to get my daughter back down here. Like, <laughs> Um, and, and, uh, it's, it's been a transition. Yeah. I mean, he and I, we've, we've been close, but I'd say we're most close, uh, when it comes to hunting Mm -hmm. or like business. I love, I like talking to him about just, you know, being successful and he has a really cool story. So it's, it's cool to like lean on him, um, outside of being a dad, you know, like he's, this is a very interesting person. So more of like on a professional level. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. He's found a lot of success and, um, I don't know. He inspires me. So it's great. With that said, I think it's just so, so good to take advantage of the time that we have with people around us. They don't even have to be like our parents, but you know, our friends right. that we hunt with, um, it's just time is very precious. And for those of us who are hunters, we know, how precious that time out there is. And in the past couple of years, I've stepped away from being a professional hunting guide for an outfitter and focusing more on hunting with my friends and family, because it's something that you, you can't ever take away. You know, it's those, those are the moments that I think back. Those are like the most detailed memories I have. And like all the feelings come back when I think of it, you know, it's not like going out to dinner with your friends, like, you're like, who, right. who did I even talk to with over that table when I could even hear the conversations, you know? But, yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's been super cool for me to experience that perspective shift in the last couple of years and has kind of brought a whole different light and meaning to hunting now versus it's like my career, like, let's see how much money I can make this week. Hopefully I get this person a bowl to, you know oh, I'm going to hunt with this friend for this amount of days and then I'm going to go hunt with my family and then I'm going to go travel over to Utah and then I'm going to go to Montana and see this person. And uh, right. I wish I could do it year round. <laughs> I wish yeah. it was something we could do year round, but uh, those are special times out there. Yeah, I love that. I love that contrast too. Like you just made me think about all the times that I have been like at a brunch with people and it's loud and, uh, you know, sometimes the conversation isn't, it's not even meaningful and Mm -hmm. but I can't remember a time that I was sitting around a campfire that I didn't just like get soaked into the conversation because you just it's just quiet you know like I don't know it just makes me miss September so bad right is it September yet (laughs) I know wall Uh, tent camp yes campfires and Mm -hmm. I'm really excited I'm going to Montana to hunt bear uh, with Henry, nice. with Henry Rifle, so my friend Chris is coming out. He's gonna film, and I'm gonna hunt, and that's something new to me. So I'm, I've always held a bear tag in my pocket during archery season because there are a ton of bears in the area, and it's, you know, if I see a bear, I'll shoot it. But my main focus sure. is elk, so I haven't like spent a lot of time intentionally looking for a bear and trying to harvest one. So right, really excited to get away for five days or so and disconnect and set up the wall tent and have a fire and eat food over the stove and hunt for some bears, you know, and just be away from it all. And this connection with Chris, I met through Rocky Mountain Sportswomen. He came out and documented a hunt with us, a waterfowl hunt that we did. And that's awesome. But it was cool because he initially found out about Rocky Mountain Sportswomen because of one of my photos that I took of my friend Jamie from a previous hunt that she posted on Instagram and he liked the photo and was like, who are you guys? Like, this is a cool photo. And so it's really cool to, you know, now him and I are going to go out. We actually have a really cool, uh, short film idea that we're, we're talking about. So we're going to do a little bit of filming and maybe come up with some sort of trailer on kind of, I have kind of a crazy wild story that all connects to mainly hunting, but overall being in nature and pushing and challenging ourselves. So really looking forward to that and exploring, you know, a new species and there's going to be whether or not I am successful, I'm just really excited to get out there and 
fully submerse myself again and be away from this craziness. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah. When, what, when are you going? I guess, what, May, maybe? Yeah, second week of May. That's cool. I'll be headed to Montana um, end of May for bears, too. We're going to go on horseback. And um, same same kind of thing. Like, I've hunted black bears year after year, but it's always been up in Alberta. It's this totally, this, t- this style will be totally different than anything else Mm -hmm. so yeah that's awesome you have to keep me posted on on how y'all do and for sure you know successful or not especially if y'all do a film that's really cool i love short films yeah i think they they can paint a really um more accurate picture of the heart of a hunter so exactly and i feel like it's really good timing for all that right now and um yeah yeah, just super excited for that. Well, thanks for coming on today, Jess. It was great chatting. Um, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to stay in touch. Maybe try and do some hunting together. I'm doing a early season pronghorn. I don't know if maybe you would want to come to Colorado and chase some pronghorn in really? August. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Are you doing um, bow or rifle? Bow. I'm going to try and it's going to be the whole spot and stock. Get a little oh my gosh, predator my decoy, pop up decoy, <laughs> and be crawling around in the cactus and the hot August sun. So, oh, I've I, heard yeah, I did, horror stories I, of it. <laughs> no, I did it a couple years ago in Wyoming, and for whatever reason, I thought it'd be really, you know, interesting to do no water, no decoy, spot and stalk. And I missed so many times, and mm-hmm. then finally I connected, but it was the most frustrating. Aunt- really and truly the most frustrating hunt to date yeah um but i don't know a decoy a decoy might just change everything i haven't tried that so i've been hearing a lot of great uh, things they're the ones that you attach to your bow whether it's like the ultimate predator mm -hmm, ultimate predator yeah so i've used those on pigs and turkey and i've taken one on an elk hunt but um i didn't use it to kill an elk Mm -hmm. but yeah no i've seen I've seen them work, uh, just not on antelope. But I, I haven't tried it. So I, I did that one antelope hunt, and I was like, I think I'd be totally fine <laughs> just smoking one with a rifle next time. Yeah. <laughs> I've got like, this out of my system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shooting from 300 yards. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing with turkey. I was like, well, I want my first one to be with a bow. And now ever since then, I shoot them all with a shotgun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I you just, know, I don't feel that way about every species, mm-hmm. but there are a couple that I'm like, yeah, yep. I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah, my goal. Is w- yeah, for sure, we'll do that. Um, yeah, my goal this year is to to shoot a turkey with my bow as well. And everyone keeps telling me maybe you should just bring a shotgun along just in case. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm yeah. gonna sh- fling an arrow at it, and I'm not gonna have time to pull up the gun and shoot because it's gonna be gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, sometimes, sometimes you do have time. It just depends. Yeah. I, I've only hunted Rio's and they're, they can be pretty dumb, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, it's fun, no doubt. And I know there's a lot of diehard elk hunters that hate hearing that this, but when you get turkeys running into you, it's, it is, it really is so very similar to elk hunting in the mm-hmm. rut. It is yeah. like, I know they don't like to hear that. Um, and some of them will admit that it is very similar, but it gets your heart pumping to have a bird come in full mm-hmm. speed right at you. And they're calling uh, and they have no idea you're there. Yeah. No. Yeah. And they're beating up the decoys and mm-hmm. like coming in hot, pissed off. It's, it's a rush. It really is. It's fun. All right. So huntandfool.com. Is that where people can yep. find information on Hunt Fool? And then uh, where can people find you as well if they want to get in touch or follow along? Um, all my platforms and as well as my website is follow her arrow, follow her arrow.com. And then I'm on uh, Instagram and Facebook. I'm on Twitter too, but I I don't <laughs> do a lot with it. Yeah. So I feel like yeah, it's phasing Huntful, out. Yeah. And then um, Hunt and Fool is without the G. So mm-hmm. just people get that mixed up a lot yeah well i love everything you're doing keep doing what you're doing it's great i love following along so thank you I, again I really appreciate on. you having fun yeah we'll keep in touch um let me know about the bear hunt and turkey hunt and everything else and it's been cool to connect with another woman um on a on a 
on a deeper level than a, you know, through a screen. So yeah, thanks exactly. for reaching out. It's been lovely. All right. Have a good one, Jess. All right. You too. This is God's country.